Doug Gertson. Well, you want to sit in the middle. Yeah, wherever you want to sit. Yeah, you want to make it make it look like it's filled yeah. up. Yeah, that would be. Sure. Uh, is it about training company? No, they canceled it. We're it. We rolled number nine. We hit him with old number nine. Hey, Mr. Commissioner with number nine. We're at Trump. We don't even do medical. Yeah. 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 Or or wherever you want to sit. <laughs> yeah, you want to make it make it look like it's still there. Yeah, yeah, that would be. Sure. I'm totally blocking you guys out. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, we're just starting. Let's try to go mine. Uh, I'm going to sit there. Uh, like you We're at Trump. We don't even do that. 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 We're at
I'd like to le actually leave the hospital and not just make a TER. Right. So uh, we're totally, you know, they're, I'll be totally dependent on all of you to make that happen. So what I want to do is have John do kind of the science thing, and then Jess and Dave are getting together, and they're going to schedule this within the fire training cadre over the next 30 days or so, and we're going to all go out and hit all the fire stations and do some hands-on practice and, and – uh, Make it work that way. So I, you know, I was a little, well, not a little. I was a whole lot optimistic. I was hoping to shoot this off the next couple of weeks, but uh, Jesse brought me back to reality through Dave and said, "No, that ain't going to happen." So February one, we could probably can we do it? By oh yeah, if not by the end of January. Okay, so uh, I think the key is just to practice, and, and it's going to be a learning curve for some of us, but. Uh, I think it'll go well, and I think long term we're going to see some results out of that, and and that'll you know make us feel much much better by seeing these people actually leave the hospital rather than admit them back to ICU and let them die a day or so later, or not ever make it out of ER. So, with that, my good friend John has agreed to uh, come over and share his knowledge, and after that five minutes is over, he'll talk about. <laughs> yeah. <it. laughs> Talk about yeah, four of the five is just another introduction, so yeah. There you go, so it's all yours, my man. All right. Jesse, slides. Yes, sir. Camera. Action, whatever, okay. Well, thanks, Terry. Um, so, at, you know, I, I know a lot of you, I don't know all of you, so some quick background. I started back in the day, 1979, at uh, Pasadena Department as a volunteer. Took EMP, got hired into Newton Ames, also worked there for 16 years before I came over and taught at Hutch uh, for about three and a half years before I said the county called and said, hey, you're working in the wrong place. And so I went down there, I was in Sedgwick County EMS for about four years, and then transitioned to the newly formed office of the medical director of the system, and worked there until 2013. So about uh, what you're looking at uh, here today, it's going to have Sedgwick County reference, and I'm always kind of queasy about that because you're not Cedric County and I get that. But you'll have to figure out on your own what are you going to do in, in Hutch and Reno County? How are you going to make this work for you? And that's what you're going to do. So don't get too hung up on the specifics about what I'm talking about. Look at sort of the broader uh, tone. This was a seven year project uh, for us. And the first uh, four years of that were just convincing the medical director that we should do this. Because the medical director's thing was to say, we only run, you know, less than one percent of our calls for cardiac arrest. Why would we spend a bunch of time on that? And the answer is twofold. One is it's kind of important for the people who are in cardiac arrest. But the second piece to that is that how you function on a cardiac arrest really is reflective of how you function on everything else. And uh, I was fortunate enough to work uh, eventually for Dr. Sabina Braithway, the system medical director. And she got that, it clicked with her one day, and she said, let's get this done. And so then I was very fortunate to have a team of people from the fire service agencies and from the EMS there who really did the lion's share of work. So I, I, the other thing I would say is, don't think of this as the John Friesen show. This is a collaborative system effort that did this, and they're showing some great results for it. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my, I. I Again, come out of Newton Angels, and so I, there's an affinity between Newton and Hodge, and that affinity is that they were the first of the first to be providing ALS care in Kansas, and for that matter, uh, on the leading edge of the nation, and that's a pretty cool thing. So I, I drug this picture up, a uh, blast from the past, we're in the code out on Highway 50, and I thought, uh, as I looked at that, that one of the things that has happened to us in cardiac arrest is we're often in a lot of places running that just like we did back in the 70s when we got our start running ALS codes. And we can't do that and push the numbers past where they were for years and years and years. And so if you're willing to make some changes, you may well see a doubling in your survival rate. And not only that, but you'll see people leave with the CPC score of one or two. And I'll talk about what CPC is. So if that's uh, already on your list of, oh great, I don't know about that, stand by, we'll get to that. So the long-held belief 
amongst paramedics has been it's about the drugs. And um, to the point where we've become very complacent in a lot of places about the CPR. So complacent that when uh, they've done studies and looked at compression fraction time. So compression fraction is the amount of time that I'm actively pushing on the chest. In a lot of cases, they were coming up with 50%. So 50% of the time, get compressions. The other 50% of the time, they were doing no compressions because they were busy intubating, starting IVs, getting medications, doing things that got in the way of what is actually one of the two things that we know saves people out of cardiac arrest, and that is compressions. So for the ALS provider, uh, for me, this was a huge mindset shift. I mean, when I, when I got my start as a medic, it was all about the drugs, and the drugs were what got people back. I remember calcium was my favorite medication because you could push calcium to a rock and it would start to beat. <laughs> And and Terry referenced it earlier, but you know you get those people to the hospital and you're fist bumping. Well, actually, we didn't fist bump back in the '80s, so we were high five and we were doing that. And I'll talk about the '80s sometime later. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we were ecstatic, but you begged it. They went to the ICU where they lingered for a little while and they died. Well, what's the value of that? The value is you, you increase a lot of cost, right? And we felt good. So just a quick look at medications. And the question is, does the medication increase the return of spontaneous circulation? And does it increase long-term survival? So we're not even asking the question of, are they neurologically intact? We're just asking the question of, are they going to live for a while? Well, if you look at epinephrine 1 to 10,000, there's a clear uh, demonstration that it improves the ability to get ROS but there's no correlation with happy one to 10 on long-term survival, none whatsoever. Let's look at amiodarone and lidocaine because we've hung on to the antiarrhythmics for a good long time as being a, a good thing. Uh, and I think I misspoke, it wasn't a 2014 study, it was a 2015 study where they looked at amiodarone versus lidocaine versus normal saline placebo. There was a slight edge, slight edge, with amiodarone, but it's not the amiodarone you're giving. It's a new amiodarone that's packaged with a different uh, distillate that keeps it from um, separating out of the fluid. And so what you're giving, what I was giving when I was practicing uh, actively in the streets, has a couple of things that keep it diluted in the solution that depress myocardial contractility. So they were given a different amiodarone. They showed a little bit of a positive effect with that, but long term, there was no increase in ROS, statistically significant increase, and none for long term survival. So those are the big things that, that we give in cardiac arrest today uh, with ACLS guidelines. Calcium chloride, no, no. Atropine, nope. The atropine was so ineffective that ACLS took it out of the algorithm. Right? I mean, it's just gone. Sodium bicarb? No, no. Um, and, and so if, if you're going, why is sodium up there? Then you're a new medic. Because if you're an old medic, you get that. When I started, the first thing we did before we even defibrillated was give two amps of sodium bicarb, which took, I don't know, half an hour. And then we got on with it. <laughs> the asterisk, there are some things, tricyclic antidepressant overdoses, where you may want to give that. And glucose isn't up here, but glucose would be another one where. If you have a patient who's hypoglycemic, of course, that would be associated with not only ROS, but long-term survival, probably. And mag sulfate, there's nothing. And so I throw this slide up initially, uh, targeting obviously the medics in the room to say, it ain't about the drugs. It just isn't about the drugs, sorry. We used to think that you, you arrive at the drug box and set it down, help us here, now it's gonna get better. Well, not so much. What matters? Early and effective compressions matter a lot. Uh, if, if we could throw money at the citizen CPR thing, we'd see our save rates skyrocket because that's what really matters. And you'll notice it doesn't say CPR, it just says compressions. So one of the things that we now know, and are you guys looking at CCR? Is that the direction you're heading? Okay. What we know is that the average person who drops, so it's a primary cardiac event, 
boom, down they go. They've got about a liter of oxygen in their system. It's in the tissues, it's in the bloodstream, it's there and it's accessible. You and I, up, moving, normally functioning, we're using about <coughs> 250 milliliters of oxygen a minute. So theoretically, I've got about a four minute reserve for what I'm doing right now. If I'm in cardiac arrest, I don't need 250 milliliters per minute. And that's kind of the theory behind CCR is, you've got oxygen there, you just need to circulate. And so early and effective compressions and then right time to defibrillation, which really should be early, but if you shock a heart that does not have coronary perfusion, then you get what we call a field kill. You're just gonna go to asystole, right? And so it needs to be the right time. That's what actually matters. So let's look at a couple of facts about high-performance EMS systems. Um, that's, that's where we want to be. One of the things when it comes to cardiac arrest, the only saves that matter are CPC one or two. So the CPC, what is that? It's cerebral perfusion category score. And they rank it from one to five. A one is you are as neurologically intact after the arrest as you were before you arrested. So it, you know if you had had a deficit before and you arrest, you're not going to come out playing the piano after that. It doesn't get better, right? But you'll be like you were before in a one. With a two, you have what we call a mild cognitive disability. So you're not quite where you were, but you're pretty close. And we worry about CPC ones and twos because the twos often get better over the course of the year after the arrest. So they, they may well get all the way back to where they were before, but it doesn't happen the day that they wake up in the ICU after they've had therapeutic hypothermia. A three is moderate disability, a four is significant disability. So with moderate, you're gonna need help getting through life, but you'll probably still be able to do some constructive things with a four, you're not, you're gonna need assistance with, with just basic daily functions. And with a five, you're gonna be what, what as a medic I always thought about as just as a vegetative state. You're gonna be, be laying there. So uh, these, these high performance systems, they're only concerned about CPC ones and twos. And you don't know that when you deliver them to the hospital. So great, you got Ross, that's just the start of the battle. Now let's see where we get them. Did we do things right that we preserve, preserve brain function? The other thing that they do is if they're gonna code someone, they go all out, they play to win. And this was a big thing in the Wichita City County system. We had a lot of medics and, and, and fire crews as well who would, would start CPR, but they would even be actively talking out loud saying, yeah, we're not gonna get this one back. And our thing there was to say, stop that. You play to win. If you're gonna code somebody, you code like they're gonna get up and walk to the stretcher, okay? That's your mindset. And so you, you simply cannot enter in, if you're in a high performance system, you can't enter in halfway. You gotta be all in. Are you there to, to resuscitate, to get Ross, to do all the things that they can get CPC one and two status walking out of the hospital or not? Three, they make they make the things easy that they can because they need more time to think clinically. And so with an engineered process, with a pit crew process, it becomes amazing how much time you as a medic have to think. And you know, if you don't get the person back in an early counter shock, then we're into H's and T's, right? You gotta start working those things. I don't know about you, but I kind of got the impression H's and T's were for a systole and later on down the road. Now we don't have a back, so we're gonna start thinking H's and T's. H's and T's should be thought about right at the outset. And so we want to create this time to think. When we were uh, in Cedric County, when we were putting it together, I had uh, Bill Robin and Angela Hamilton were my EMS crew that were working with the fire crews to figure out what works for us. It got to the point where, um, it used the term, the call slowed down so much for them that about the third time in, I heard Angela ask Bill, so where are you guys gonna go on vacation today? And I thought, yeah, we're on the right track. And so uh, one of the things that we had to then tell medics was, you know what, you got this fire crew that's, that's keeping the person going, functioning, 
your time is to think clinically, not about vacation. Okay. And then the last thing is they're never good enough at what they do. They learn and improve. They're always learning and improving. If you ever get the chance to interact with somebody from Seattle, King County, do that. They're just fanatical about this. And so I'm fortunate enough to have a contact through Mike Helbach there. And what I know about Seattle King County is they don't ever assume they've arrived. They're flirting. Uh, they've actually been at a, a, a CPC 1 and 2 uh, and, and survival rate in VFIB VTAC at 60% and bending back down a little bit. But that's just phenomenal. I don't know where you're at. I know what things were at uh, back when I was at Newton, and that was we hovered around 20%. We thought we were pretty good. They were getting 60% two years ago. 60%. And if you're thinking, yeah, but you throw in the asystoles with that, it's a lot different than the PEAs. Yeah, it is a lot different, but you know what? Asystoles never been a survival, ry survival rhythm, and it likely isn't going to be. It, it becomes a rhythm that we work because it helps us hone our craft for the people who really can be resuscitated. They're in VFib or VTAC, they're shockable. Although, PEA used to look a lot like a Sicily, right? Cedric County's got PEAs walking out CPC 1 and 2 all the time. Why? Because they have time to find the nature of the teeth that's causing the problem. That's why. And so the, the story is changing on uh, the PEA. I, I kind of label these five cardiac arrest keys that we want to pay attention to. The first one is compression fraction, the amount of time that you're actively pressing on the chest. The second is metronomes. The third is checklists. Then a little bit about end title and some thoughtful airway interventions, which uh, if you're a medic, might challenge you, I don't know. And then pit crew or the engineer of resuscitation. And so let's kind of take a look and work our way through these. Terry, you said an hour, right? Yeah, I'm kind of working at it. <laughs> In educator time, that's three hours, so I think we'll be okay. I understand that. So compression fraction is the time that you're act actively compressing, and it is everything. As a matter of fact, what we know is if you're below 80%, you're probably not going to resuscitate the person. So how do you know this? Well, here's step one for your system. you got to start looking in earnest at the background data that comes out of the machine. So AEDs and defibrillators, main defibrillators, both now will run with background data that shows your compressions. And you've got to go look at that. In the Cedric County uh, EMS system, what we did was we pulled that data. Uh, we couldn't get it off of AEDs technology, right? But we'd get it off the live packs. And so we began pulling that, and it has to be annotated. Someone has to sit down and make sure that the computer actually recognized all the compressions that were in there. We did that work, and it gave us two pieces of information that we wanted to know. One was, what's the compression fraction? And the second was, what was the longest pause? And that's huge. We have to know the longest pause, because we never, ever want to exceed 10 seconds. That kills people. I'll tell you more about that. So we get that data in the system. What do we do with it? We share it. So if engine uh, seven, squad seven, and medic 31 run a cardiac arrest call, within about 36 to 48 hours, they get an email that shows how they did. They get that information. And it also has our standards. So we set our standard as a compression fraction in the system of greater than 90%. We want it to be past the 80. They're routinely running 95, 96% compression fractions in Cedric County. I've been flat out amazed by it. That, there, there's, that's not a coincidence to an increased resuscitation rate. The more you're on the chest, the better off you are. You would think 100% is where you want to be, you can't get there. Because you have to have pauses, right? You have to do a pulse check, you got to have, have interventions in terms of defibrillation that you need to do. So you really can't get to 100%. 96 is sort of considered the golden standard. Preferred compression rate, uh, as you know from AHA and CPR, it's 100 to 120. Just a little bit of background information about that. 120 is the sweet spot. You want to push the most blood manually with compressions. 
you're going to compress at 120 compressions a minute. The danger of setting your target there is that if you go to 121, you get an immediate drop off because it, the heart can't refill as fast as it needs to. Sedgwick County landed on 110, and I would have people ask, well, how did you end up at 110? And the answer is, I had 100 metronomes laid out on my uh, kitchen counter that I had to set the rate on, and Braithwaite hadn't decided. And I called her, it was about 8 o'clock at night, and I said, you got to decide what's the compression rate. And so she said, well, we'll split the difference and go 110. So there wasn't really science to it, but if you go look at the science on compressions, if you're at 100, or you're at 110, or you're at 120, you're going to be okay. What matters is compression fraction. And it matters that you stay within that rate as well. And so that, that rate becomes this huge important thing. And that's why we move the second item here, and that is metronomes. They have done numerous studies. And I'll, I'll show you one in particular here momentarily. Uh, they found a couple of things. Do you think people without a metronome are people kind of engineered to compress slower than 100 or faster than 120? What do you think? Yeah, the inherent rate that people kind of settle in on is around 140. And the problem with that is you don't push blood. At 140, you're not pushing blood. More is not always better, right? And so metronomes, time and again, when they look at it, metronomes keep people in rate. So in Central County, when they're doing their annotation, they're looking at the rate. And they expect the rate to be at 110 plus or minus about three or four. And that's what they're getting. So they're always within the rate that is recommended uh, for effective compressions. They, they chose, uh, we chose, I guess, actually I chose because I ordered them. That particular metronome, there's no magic to it. Uh, problem with, with this one, it's a little digital metronome, is if you bump it, you'll offset the rate. Uh, I was really worried about that, except that people, uh, after they hear it for a while, have the rate in their head, and they can tell when it changes, and they'll just pop it back over. Uh, the ones we use at the college, we have them attached to the monitor, and it does not move as easily um, as, as these do. But you can see, they just have them zip tied, uh, to both the AEDs and the life packs, and there, there's not a life pack or an AED that doesn't have a metronome either zip tied to it or internal to the machine. So that that is is a standard process. So uh, real quick, just because I I'm always sensitive to the people who are saying, oh yeah, I hear what you're saying, but where's the science on it? So here's a little science on a study that was done in 2010 published in Academic Emergency Medicine. And there were a couple of things that came out of it that I think are really important for us to pay attention to. One is that when you look at um, the compression rate uh, and how that uh, worked, you saw that they were accurately doing compressions rate-wise five out of 34 times with no metronome. But if you add a metronome, you get to 100%. So small old tool, and uh, what I found in Central County was there were, there were a fair number of people who said, I don't need a metronome. Well, this is just one. There's more studies that say, no, you need a metronome. And, and you know, even when you add a metronome, I've always been amazed at the number of people who compress at odds with the metronome top. But I assume those people can't dance either. And so, you know, I don't know. But, the other thing that's interesting about this is metronomes decrease overventilation. And that's the other thing that you need to be thinking about. I've been hammering away at compressions here. Ventilations kill people. They just flat out kill people. You and I, we breathe normally by pulling our diaphragm down and lifting the rib cage up, and we create negative pressure, air rushes in, right? When you use a bag valve mask, it don't work that way. What you're doing at that point is positive pressure ventilation, and you're pushing air in. Well, guess what? When you're pushing air in, you're pushing other stuff out, namely blood returning to the heart. So your effectiveness of, of uh, compressions and circulation go down the more you ventilate. 
Dr. Tom Ochterheide did the first study on this. He's out of Milwaukee. They looked at or ventilation rates in large cities uh, within the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium. They found uh, ventilation rates as high as 50 per minute. So they coached them and said, quit doing that and made progress. They got down to 34. That, that kills people. In, in the Sedgwick County system, and again, it's just where they landed, it's not the gospel truth. How, how many times have they been waiting a minute? Take a guess. Eight. Just over six. And, and those are one-handed ventilation over two seconds. And the reason they do that over two seconds is you get two upstrokes during that time, which simulates the normal breathing process. So it, it pulls air in. And that's more than enough. They're not producing a bunch of vegetables that go lay in hospital beds. They've significantly increased their CPC one and two uh, saves. Compressions, we have to pay attention to compressions. Uh, you know, I, one of the things I had a medic say to me in Sedgwick County is, well, you've taken the drugs away, reason. So what are we supposed to pay attention to? And I said, you should pay attention to doing everything you can to support good quality compressions and, and the pit crew that's at work on your behalf and actually doing the work that's going to save the patient. That's what you should do. And so what do we know? We know that we need to be deep enough. And that's kind of hard to, to gauge unless you have uh, in your, what are you, are you a soul shot? Do you have the pox to come with them? We have CPR feedback. feedback. Okay, so you've got some real time data and that's what you want to tell you um, how, how deep are you compressing, okay? The other piece of that though is you, you get that person who's compressing away but they're into the code and they're a little tired <laughs> and they're just resting on the chest in between, yeah, that's a problem. So you have to have complete recoil. You've got to come up off the chest. You can't lean on it. Push hard, push fast. Maintain the rate where it needs to be so you're using a metronome. And then this idea that we never, ever pause for greater than 10 seconds, ever. What, what Idris and others found in their uh, study work on this was when you pause compressions for greater than 10 seconds, you never get back to the level of blood flow that you were before. So once you start compressions, you have to just do everything possible to guard against that. Well, here's the first fly in the ointment, and that's the AED. So Dr. Copas out of uh, Seattle uh, probably says it best, and that is the best thing ever developed for somebody in BFib was the AED, early defibrillation. The worst thing ever developed for someone in cardiac arrest <coughs> who's not in VFib was the AED. Why? How long is your pause for that? Have you ever timed it? Like, it is about guaranteed it's over 10 seconds. And so we know that it's an acceptable loss. Defibrillation is an important component of this. But the message for the medic is when you arrive on scene, you should waste absolutely zero time getting them switched over to manual defibrillation. Get the AED off of them. That is critical. Yeah, pauses kill patients. So we rolled this out in Central County in 2012. We saw a spike up, but the other thing that we saw was despite preaching pauses should not go more than 10 seconds, we saw pauses go more than 10 seconds. So we came back in 2013 with an adjustment to the engineering. And what they do now is as soon as the person stops compressing, comes up off the chest, the next person who's ready to compress. So we're now in a check the monitor, check the pulse, defibrillator if necessary time, right? That next person puts their hands into a hover right over the spot where they're gonna compress, and they're already counting metronome beats. And they call out on the fifth beat, the 10th beat, and on the 16th, without any guidance, they're compressing. And that keeps pauses to about 9.2 seconds. So they literally eliminated 10 second or longer pauses in the system by doing that. But I, whenever I, I see that, I always have to think of Seinfeld and the soup Nazi kind of uh, approach here is you have to be fanatical about it. And as a medic, 
what, what the medics down there said is, well, if I'm not done, I'm going to just tell them not to go. And our answer in training was to tell the fire crews, ignore the medic. They, they have nothing good to bring to this. Ignore them. Start compressions when you get to the 1600 OB. And, and we've told the medics, if you can't get your work done in that time frame, you need to practice. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit down the road here, but Wake County out of North Carolina, their average peri shock time. So compression stop, they do their thing, compression start, four seconds. Okay? So it's very doable. So this was a look uh, that, and this was published in circulation in 2011, was a look at independent predictor of survival from out of hospital shock and cardiac arrest, looking at the peri shock pause. Peri shock meaning the time before the shock, the time after the shock. And the conclusion was, yep, it makes a difference. And if you dig down into this, you find that 10 second reference. They looked at less than 10, less than 20, uh, seconds and then uh, a third set being longer than 20 and what they found was that if you're at less than 10 significant improvement in survivability if you're over 10 significant decrease in survivability so a little bit of reference here um, and, and this is computer generated based off of uh, the actual uh, picture but what we're looking at are the, the blue are compressions. So when I compress, I get some systolic blood pressure, right? And they, they have monitor in uh, that's looking at this, and you can see that the longer we go, the higher the systolic uh, pressure gets with the compression. What we're really interested, though, is in the red line, which is the uh, aortic diastolic pressure. And, and so think back to how the heart perfuses. The heart does not perfuse when, the, when it beats because it's pushing all the blood out, right? It's when it's in its uh, asystole, the, the two-thirds of the cardiac cycle is just sitting there, that blood runs into the coronary arteries and perfuses the heart. So we need to know what's the aortic diastolic pressure. Well, so before we start, we're at zero, and what you see is that it takes a little bit of doing compressions before we start to consistently be up to where we're going to perfuse coronary arteries. The significance of this is if you don't perfuse the coronary arteries, it doesn't matter what you do. You can push any way you want. You can shock till the cows come home. doesn't matter. Heart's not going to be responsive to it. So how far are we in here? <coughs> we're, we're getting to the point where we're about 20 compressions in before we start getting that. This is really significant. And then the last thing to show you is that as soon as you quit compressing, you go back to zero. So in that AHA 30 to 2 uh, drill, you spend a chunk of the 30 building up to where you're perfusing coronary arteries, then you stop to give a couple of breaths, and then you start the process back over. And that is important. Now, you might look at that and say, yeah, so continuous compressions will be better. Well, uh, Dr. Kudinchak and company out of Seattle King County, they did look at that. And what they found is there's no difference in survivability between continuous compressions and the 30 to 2. What's important is you're on the chest. And don't ever pause for greater than 10. So we have to look at pauses, but I also uh, want to make the point that the engineering, the pit crew approach eliminates what I would call a hyphenated pause. And so let's look at this. Every red mark, that's the annotation that says that was a compression, okay? So lots of compressions here, right? These are second marks. so. Looks like what happened, and this is an actual case out of Sedgwick County, what happened is somebody stopped compressions, and then someone said, wait, wait, I'm not ready, and they started compressions. And so we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight compressions, and then they said, okay, now stop, and we have this period of compressions uh, before we start back up. Well, when you look at this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine, just under. It's easy to look and say, didn't violate the 10 second rule. But remember how many compressions it takes to start perfusing the coronary arteries? 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 is the actual length of that pause. That's why we engineer, that's why we do pit crew, is so that we don't ever have this. Did this kill this patient? May well have. I don't know the outcome, but I know what the statistics, how the research say about pauses over 10 seconds. So we have to script them, they begin, they end automatically. And uh, for, for the medics down there, this was, this took, it was an acquired taste, all right? Now, some of you have experience in the system down there. They were pretty adversarial when we did this. And the, the beauty of going to this process was twofold. One is it improved firefighter and EMS relationships in working together. But the other thing that it did was for the fire crews, it reinforced to them, if the patient's going to survive, they will survive because of you. They will survive because of the work that you're doing. And so they've taken real ownership to it. My hat's off to them. They, uh, I, I've been gone since 2013, and I often wondered when I walked out the door, will they continue doing it? And it has just been culturated. It is a part of who they are. They're very proud of it and do very well with it. So we'll, we'll talk about the, the BLS triangle uh, as being compressor on this side, compressor on this side, and person up at the airway. And of course, two compressors, they're doing two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, two minutes, and the airway person is just monitoring the airway and, and implementing the ventilation strategies. They are the ones that initiate the pause at the 220 compression mark. Remember, they're running 110 minute, right? So this is a two minute cycle. And then it automatically ends at the 16th beep of the metronome. The code commander, who's uh, the paramedic that, you know, that owns that call, they are the one with the monitor, and they're working with the paramedic who's across from the patient uh, from them. They have to be ready. And so in their system, the uh, fire crew is doing compressions. The person compressing is just quietly counting in their head. And then when they get towards the end of 20, they'll say 17, 18, 19, 20, and then they'll go quiet, counting 17, 18, 19, 20. The person at the airway is calling out 20, 40, 60, 80, it's just this cadence as it were. But when they get to 180, they get pretty aggressive and they get the, the code commander's eyes. It's like 180, bold, it's sharp, it's out loud. And the code commander knows at that point, I've got exactly 40 compressions to get my act together to keep my peri shock time down. And so they do two things. They reach over and find the femoral pulse because it should be there with good compressions, right? When the compressions stop, instant answer, do I have a pulse or not? The other thing they do is they charge the defibrillator. And, and we had a little kickback on this. They said, I'm not gonna charge it if it's asystole. And the answer was, you will charge it every single time. Asystole, PA, BFib, doesn't matter. You're gonna charge it. Why? Because it's a process that you can't ever make a mistake on. So it's like using ICS on calls. We use it all the time. Why? Because we don't ever wanna not use it when it's time to use it. So the next person to compress, they go into the hover, they're counting the beeps, they at 16, down they go. Only the code commander has the authority to stop compressions from starting again, and that is only if there's a pulse. So they can't stop it for anything else. And, and we've had a couple instances there where uh, the, the code commander said, well, I want you to stop compressions for a bit so I can look at and the fire crews basically just looked back at them and said, were you at the same training session we were as they were compressing? And it's like, okay. can you intubate while compressions are going? Yes. Can you start IVs? Yes. Can you push meds, start IOs? Yes, yes, yes. The answer is you can do all of that. Compressions have to, have to be going. And then again, charge the defibrillator, find the pulse before the pause. If you're not ready for the pause, uh, what we have allowed down there for the code commander to do is to say, keep going 
I'm not ready. And I'll show you what that looks like with the idea that they're going to be ready shortly. So their, the way their script runs, again, a minute is 220 compressions, and it kind of looks like this. At compression one, code commander is running the protocol. At 180, they stop whatever they're doing and shift the focus. they got to find that femoral pulse. they got to make sure that the, the, the deferred layer is ready to go. They're, they're using, actually, LP15s now. So at 200, they push charge, and they've got a finger on the pulse. And then they act within 10 seconds or less. So Wake County, again, routinely less than four seconds on the prairie shock pauses. The old clear, 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 or I'm clear, you're clear, everyone's clear, that's a waste of time. What you ought to be thinking is, during the pause, someone's liable to get shocked, and the last thing I want to do is be touching them. So what, what we told them in the system there is, if you get shocked, you own it. You know what's coming. We're not going to say clear. Maybe we'll say shocking as we push the button. So stay out of the way. Won't kill you, but it'll make you act silly for a bit. Because of Wake County's work, they've adopted this idea that 40 is the new 20. And so let me explain this. We have for years said, we run a code for 20 minutes. If we don't get anything back, what do we do? We call it, right? Well, not so fast there. This is Wake County's data, and uh, their now former medical director, Dr. Brent Meyer, did a lot of great work with this. So LOR is length of resuscitation in minutes, and you can see 10 down through 60. What he wanted to know, because they quit transporting uh, people who didn't respond, and that's not unlike Sedgwick County. I don't know what your practice is here, but Sedgwick County, uh, you've got to be showing signs of viability to get transport. Otherwise, they're going to leave you on a scene as a code class. And Dr. Meyer said, I'm a little uncomfortable leaving people that shouldn't be leaving, right? So how, how many is that? So they took years of data from the time they started high performance, and what they looked at was survivability. And so you can see in the asystole column that it doesn't matter you know, how quickly they respond, you're never going to get to 1%. All right? Asystole is still asystole. We'll get it figured out. But look at the VFib VTAC. So at the 10-minute mark, their data, which was hundreds of patients, thousands of patients, said 81% of those people are still liable to be resuscitated. Don't give up. Well, how far down do we go? If you go to the 40 minute mark in their system with high performance CPR, right time to fibrillation, doesn't matter what the drug protocol is, throw that to the side. 17, almost 18% of those people are still viable at 40 minutes. One of the things you'll find with high-performance CPR where you're running a compression fraction of 96% is that the person who's in cardiac arrest will be trying to remove your hands from their chest. Okay, The perfusion's that good. So they, they drew the line and said, we're going to go at least 40. I find it interesting, in 45, still 11% of those people are viable. That beats Detroit. Uh, EMS, uh, last I looked, uh, by 9%. Not to beat up on Detroit, they're getting better, but, um, you know, 11%, that's a save rate in a lot of places. The checklists. What we want is, we want to do great VLS care so that the medic has time to think H's and T's. That's what we're looking for. And so where does this come from? Dr. Gwande uh, is out, out of Back East Women's and Children's Hospital in, in Boston, and he has a book out called The Checklist Manifesto, uh, which really prompted the revolution of checklists in hospitals. And there's case after case of where uh, care has been improved by using a checklist. And the surgery suite is kind of his area, and that, that's where um, he, he saw the biggest impact, and that's gone nationwide. 
So a couple quotes, our great struggle in medicine these days is not just with ignorance and uncertainty, it's also with complexity, how much you have to make sure you have in your head and think about a thousand ways things can go wrong. And so what he has long held is with a checklist, you don't ever miss something, you don't do something wrong. And, and resuscitation is a complex thing. You can't afford to miss a pause and let it go greater than 10, right? That, that's something that we should never let happen. We miss stuff, we're inconsistent, we're unreliable because of the complexity. And so um, he, he advocates checklists and high performance systems have gone to checklists. So you, know, you go to uh, Wichita City County, open up a, any, any airway jump bag, and what you're gonna find is what? Checklist, right? And so uh, this is the example we use at Hutch Community College. It's similar to the example uh, that they use probably because it was less work. And so there is a BLS component. So um, one of the pieces is designate and announce the BLS team leader. So even though they may know each other, they still, you know, I'm, I'm John, I'll be the code commander. Uh, I'm Matt, I'll be the uh, BLS team leader. And what that does is it opens the door for people to speak up. Because down there, I don't know about over here, but down there, there's real hierarchy, if you will. Of, I'm the medic, you're a little EMT, don't tell me what to do. And we can't have that on a cardiac arrest. If the lowly EMT sees something not going well, they need to speak up. It's not about you, it's about the patient. So there's introduction. They ensure metronome's on, set right. They ensure that they're switching compressor every two minutes. You should never go past two minutes uh, for more than a couple seconds because of making sure you don't have a long pause. Ensure compression and pause counts are, are happening. So those are out loud things. Uh, determine who uh, who is um, next for compressions and immediately making sure the switch takes place. And so what down there, they're throwing a bunch of resources. I don't know what your average code blue response is here, but it's not uncommon down there to have a squad engine, a safety officer, uh, a, a medic division leader, and, and the medic unit there. And so it's kind of, at a certain point, it becomes resource management. I, I stood and watched a code pool site one day uh, that had two engines, a squad, an ambulance, and a, and a medic, uh, medic division leader, uh, as well as safety officer, and they just formed a line, and the whole thing just kept flowing. Uh, no one did compressions more than about every uh, six, seventh person in that case. What cycle are we on? It's important because down there at the fourth cycle, they start ventilating. So they need to know when that's coming. Um, is it a non-hypoxic arrest or a hypoxic arrest? So are we doing CCR initially? Or are we doing CPR initially? Uh, and then defibrillation, how many shocks? On the ALS side, um, they, they mandate patches first. Uh, the fast patches, they do not go to limb leads until after rocks. So the old idea that, well, I got limb leads in case it's a cyst leak, it might be the sneaky V3 that's hiding. Yeah, the new monitors are better than that. And so they just work off of fast patches so they're ready to go. And tidal CO2, the airway, complications, the H's and T's, it's not an inclusive list, it's only the stuff that they can do things about. And then do, do we get ROS? The BLS team leader uh, is the one who's supposed to work this. And they'll cover you up with the code commander, be side by side. Uh, the fire crews were kind of nervous about that at first, saying, oh, we don't know about all this ALS stuff. And what quickly became the reality is you don't need to know about it. You need to work the checklist. And you need to help me not forget something. So then they, there's also a ROS checklist, and that's probably even more important. One of the things that happens with ROS for a lot of places is it's like the emergency got more intense. Ah, the pulse is back. Let's run into the hospital. No, no, let's all take a breath, slow down. Let them just lay here for a while and physiologically stabilize, and then we'll move them in a very planned out way. And so the the uh, post or the ROS checklist is hitting on how are we going to, where are we going to go, how are we going to get there, how are we going to load to the cot, doing a 12, leaving at about the 5 to 10 minute marks uh, once they've stabilized a little bit, getting fluid going if needed, addressing blood pressure concerns, that sort of thing. Uh, the checklist. An acquired taste, 
but it does your patients a huge favor. So um, I, I think, and I, I get this as a medic, I, I had enough bravado in me to say, yeah, I got this, don't worry about it. But the answer yeah, is, without a checklist, you're gonna forget things. End title, it's a reliable indicator of quality of compressions. So you already have feedback in your soles, but add the end title CO2 feedback to it. We wanna know a couple of things there. First off, it's your indicator of compression quality. So uh, in the system down there, they'll routinely see 20, 21, 22 uh, as uh, end title values with good compressions going. I don't know what your experience is with that. But when it begins to drop, it's hard to visually understand that compressions are getting worse. But when you have this number floating out there, it starts dropping down. Then you know people are getting tired, you have to give encouragement or get new people on the chest. Because again, it doesn't matter what you give med wise, that doesn't make a difference. What matters is our compression is good. It's your first indicator of ROSC, so you're running along at, let's say, 20, and all of a sudden it's showing 62. Well, guess what? You have a pulse back. And you'll know that uh, before you ever are able to palpate the pulse. So uh, their answer down there. They'll finish out the cycle because compressions on a beating heart is not a problem, but no compressions on a non beating heart, that's a problem. It's also a good indicator of a non viable patient. So if you can't, no matter what you do, if you can't get the end title up over 10, that patient is likely non viable. And Dr. Myers would tell you that he actually thinks the, the sweet spot for that is 50. And so he, he's working on that data. He left Wake County and he's now with AMR, which is a little ambulance company that operates in the country and has access to a lot more data. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Dr. Wayne out of Bellevue, uh, Washington, who's an active guy, uh, did a study and that was sort of the first place. You see the, the marker on this one, the date is 1995. So it's been around for about 12 years now that showed that 10 to him was kind of a magic number, and that's where that 10 reference comes from. Again, Dr. Myers would argue that and say, it's probably a little bit higher for determining viability. If you're not getting up above 15, then look at the compressions. The compressions are likely the problem. If that doesn't fix it, then it's the patient. Real quickly about airway. One of the changes they made down there was uh, to tell people don't innovate until after uh, six minutes. And that, that's not a random idea. That comes out of uh, the study we were just looking at and some other studies as well. And the idea behind that is innovation does nothing to save someone in cardiac arrest. It makes life easier for you. Uh, and uh, so the medic in me would always broil that and say, I know, wait a minute, it's called aspiration and it kills people, right? If you're not ventilating aggressively, i.e. 20, 30, 40 times a minute, I mean, that, that's how I was trained, was more rest the better. We were doing continuous compression before it was cool, and we were ventilating every third compression, and the, the ventilation was to take and twist the bag against your leg so that you could get I don't know, 1,800 milliliters out of a 1,600 milliliter bag, right? I mean, that was the deal. And, um, you know, I thought about writing apology notes to those people for having killed them, but didn't know any better. The thing is, when you're doing that, you get people barfing on you. But when you're doing three to 400 milliliter ventilations using the, the Queen's finger, uh, which is what Mike Helbach likes to say, is you bag with three fingers and a thumb and you hold your pinky out like you have a tea with the queen. That's how much you should be bagged. And you should push that in no faster than a second. You're probably better off over two seconds. You don't get people throwing up on you unless you caught them code blue at the chili whiskey fest. They're still going to throw up on you. But um, with that, we had a lot of kickback on this saying, you got to innovate sooner than that. No, you don't. What you have to do is pay attention to what saves people. Compressions and defibrillation, get your lines started in case they need fluid, if that, that's one of the things out there. Uh, but pay attention to what matters. 
consequently, uh, this is kind of their algorithm, and it's something that, from a system standpoint here, you need to figure out into your equation of what's going to work. So if it's a clean, non-hypoxic arrest, start compressions, put an OP airway and an on the breather mask on so they're in the CCR, right? And they do that for the first six minutes or 660 compressions. They start manual ventilations every 20th breath at the six-minute mark. And then consider an advanced airway after 660. And what we told them is, if the airway is patent, you're not getting um, distension, uh, there's no increased resistance to bagging, just stay like that. I can show you numerous studies that show if, if you want to increase your chance of not surviving, get an advanced airway. All right? If you spend time on advanced airway, you decrease survivability. Unless it's really needed. On a dirty airway that's non hypoxic, essentially what we said there is clean it. If it stays clean, move on. Don't feel like, oh, if it's dirty, I have to innovate. No, it, it may be dirty, clean it. If it stays clean, then think innovation after six minutes. If it's a hypoxic airway, so it's an asthma patient, a drowning patient, somebody who likely arrested because of lack of oxygen. Well, then we start ventilating right out of the gate. We don't do CCR. And their standard down there, if they do CCR, it doesn't matter age. So you may have heard about age criteria there. They pay no attention to age. And they have to be able to identify that it was hypoxic driven. If, if it wasn't, if it's not clear, they do CCR. And so consider the advanced airway after 660 if it's clean. And if it's dirty, then that's where and it stays dirty. You clean it and it fills up again. Okay, now we need an early advanced airway. So I, for the medics, I don't know how that's going over with you, and it really isn't my deal how it's going over with you. If it's me, I'll hold off on it. But um, what I'll challenge you here is to, to really sit down and do a little rooting around and looking at that, because if your pattern like I was, that the first thing out of the gate, I need to get a tube in. You're not paying attention to what actually saves people. So, I, sorry, but it's the blunt truth of it. Hyperventilation, as we've talked, kills people. Ventilate less, not more. But make sure when you ventilate, you're doing well. So, one of the things that I haven't talked about, bag valve mask, two-person skill. So, number three, airway person up at the top, two-handed seal good head position, and the person who's not compressing on either side is doing a one-handed squeeze over two seconds. But it's a two-person job, not a one-person job. All right, so let's take a look at what this looks like. And Jesse, this is, uh, if you would go to the video, and I, let, let's make sure the volume's not too loud. I want to sort of talk as this goes. Okay. So uh, this is uh, Hutch people, Hutch Community College people, but it's modeled after the Central County model, which you may or may not decide to do. Uh, it's predicated on the idea that oftentimes oh, okay? down there, a couple of people arrive initially. And what you see is a very rapid uh, check for responsiveness, signs of life, and then Tina's right out and check. And Kent, the other uh, individual, has got the metric of the point already. 20. That is important. He's got a job on. Got the AD land there, and now he's going to get uh, because they're doing CCR. He's going to put an OP airway in and apply a non-retrieval mask. And he's got two minutes to get this stuff up and running because at the two-minute mark, they're going to use the AD, and then he's going to take over compression to get you know, the rest from compressions. 70, 80, 90, 80. The beauty of CCR, I think, is it gives you more hands to do those initial things. 70, 80, 90, 100. And there just is no difference. Right? Yeah. You can it, or get CCR, you can't get any difference. 70, 80, 90, 120. 
Pick so position okay, three. in this case, simulating, we, can, we have... Uh, I think Dan and I will be the BLS team, team leader. And so Dale takes the number three position. 40. Yeah. And his job is just to watch that arrow and make sure it doesn't come through your way. Make sure that uh, he's getting things set up. 17, 18, 19, 160. Down, yes, he's thinking down the road. And when you're pulling that, then suddenly trying to use it. And then, and Dan, uh, Dan's hands there. He's 17, 18, 19, 180. He's got the checklist, and he's going to start working the checklist to make sure that they're not missing anything. 17, 18, 19, 200. So they're coming up on the pawns. 17, 18, 19, 220. Analyzing operating. Do not touch the patient. Shock device. Charging. Stay clear of patient. Deliver shock now. Shock delivery. Pause. Okay, so you see the problem at the end, you can see why we're going to get out of the hand of the people at this time. 17, 18, 19, 20, 20. So now we're into the second uh, person, the number two position, is doing compressions. And 17, 18, 19, 20, 40. I'm so Jim, I'll be a code commander. Jim, I'm Dan, I'm the BLS team leader. Hey, Dan. We have a few decisions. We'll be on the 18, 20, 60. We'll be on the 20, um, so the player collapse. never sets up anywhere else if they're doing it the way it's designed. The paramedic is always down here at the patient's right legs, uh, and their job is to stay out of the triangle, the one, two, three triangle up at the, the torso and head of the patient. So you see Dan, the BLS team leader, has come around. He starts feeding information to Jim. Jim gets switched over to the manual defibrillator. And Bill's getting set up with his IV line so they can get his line going and start working the medication end of the code because, as we've talked, it gives Bill something to do. <laughs> <laughs> so what Jim's passing up there is the end title. One of the things I'd encourage you with end title is begin using it as soon as you start bagging out masking. Don't wait for an advanced airway. Is the data rock solid with a BVM? No, but it's close enough and it gives you trend. And so you should be having end title for the moment that you start ventilating. You see Jim's got a finger on the femoral pulse and he's, he's uh, at the monitor and will charge this up. Uh, as they get to the, the uh, 220 mark, he'll be ready for the pause. So Tina's in the hover, Jim does what he needs to do, and you have, I don't know, four or five second pause there. That's what it looks like when it's run well, and that is in the interest of the patient. That is absolutely in the interest of patient survivability. The other thing that you'll notice as they go, so Jim, because he's not worried about the VLS function, the fire crew has that in hand, he's able to have a discussion and come up to speed, get the history. What do you know? What's going on with this patient? Bill down here is just working the medication end of the code. And when he's ready for a medication check, he calls, gets Jim's attention. They do a med check, and he's ready to give medication and go from there. They're still in CCR. They're on their third set of compressions. So they're getting ready to, to be thinking that, all right, now when we start our next cycle, we've got to start ventilating. Dan's working the checklist. I don't know what your experience is. I know that my experience as a medic without it being engineer was that it, it was kind of hectic the whole way through. And uh, what you see here, I hope, is what I see, um, is this is a pretty calm scene. And well-run codes are like that. 
that they're just quiet. You got the ticking of the metronome in the background. You got people quietly talking about what's coming up next or what needs to be done. And we're running a compression fraction on this patient that if we were to look at the background data, I can guarantee it would be well up over 90%. It's going to be close to 96% the way that they're functioning to this point. The biggest detriment being the AED time. And so uh, Kent gets into the hover, he didn't get there as quickly as, as what I would be after, but he gets there and he's on the chest. Again, a very short uh, pause time and work just continues to flow. When, when we were setting this up, uh, we, we basically stole the Austin Travis County, Texas model at Cedric County. So that, that's essentially what you're looking at here. We pulled in uh, squad seven, engine seven, and then a medic unit into the OMD and set up mannequin. And we just said, here's the concept that's running. The first one was just a cluster. And part of it was they were trying to pay attention to time and we quickly realized you don't pay attention to time, you pay attention to compressions and the count of compressions, and that will take care of time. And so the second time it went better, the third time they just rocked it. I mean, it, it was smooth. We took a break for lunch, came back, did another round, and, and I was prepared to spend the afternoon with it, and they said, we got it. And they had made some adjustments. We quit looking at time. We were looking at compression count. Uh, and they also were the ones that decided that the number three airway position, which is Daryl in this case, and you can see two-handed seal, good head position, and one-handed squeeze the bag every 20 compressions. They decided that that person needed to be calling out these 20, 40, 60, 80 marks to help the program <coughs> commander understand where they were at in the process. So they made their own tweaks to it, but they were done, and they were sold. This met some real resistance on the front end of training. So day one, uh, I, I was there in, in that model. I would train the trainers and they would do the training, but I, I was there that day. Had medics coming in saying, this is the dumbest thing ever. And, and just can't believe how stupid this is that you're doing this. Would leave training going, that's amazing. And we told them, when you learn it, go do it. So right out of the gate, a medic unit that had been on the call or in the training, ran, got a code, taught the BLS crew, the fire crew on scene, how to do pit crew on scene, worked flawlessly from there on out. Reverse fire crew that had been in training, showed up, was running the, the pit crew. EMS showed up, they hadn't been in the training, and they're like, what the hell is this? The fire crew said, it's just about letting you work. And here's what you need to do. You set up over there, you set up there, stay out of our way, we'll stay out of yours, work well. Um, and there simply isn't a person in the system that walked away from it going, this is bad. What they said is, this is a good thing, it's good for patients, we can see the result. When you see an immediate doubling of survival rate, that's kind of a kick in the pants in a good way. Yeah, that's an amazing thing. And the beauty of that system down there is, they run enough codes that you see pretty quickly whether something's working or not working. We're getting to the point where we'll show a couple more things here. So your entire will be checked until your fourth cycle of right. step. Correct. Yeah. And so that's a little bit of trade-off. I think the advantage you have is you're getting data about compressions ongoing. And that, that's in your favor. Here we said, yeah, we really like that, but it's the front end, people aren't tired yet, so we're just gonna we're gonna visually make sure that we've got what we need. And I, I think it's a weak point, but it hasn't been weak to the point of not seeing huge results. So. You know, what's your opinion on the rescue balance? Well, my first opinion, Jeremy, was that they're expensive. <laughs> and that they didn't show an improvement. But now with the uh, rescue pod and the active compression decompression device, they're actually showing a statistically significant difference in terms of survivability. So I think rescue pods are probably in our future with the 
active compression decompression device. That that uh, Dr. Lori, who does all of that work up in Minnesota, um, I think they got embroiled in two things. One is Rusty File One didn't show statistical significance. But the other piece was, yeah, you're pushing the same thing. Oh, you're 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 off, you're so I really got embroiled in that. But I, I think their data now is probably going to help them get past that. So. 17, 18, 19, 20, 220. Well, I was there yakking. No to build up in oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Continue CPR. So uh, showing a couple of things here at the end. One is. The code commander can start compression sooner than 16 beats of the metronome. So if it's insistently it's PA, it's not shot, there's no pulse. All that data is just taking names, right? Get back on the chest. I'm not sure how long he was down. Just that, you know, this has happened before. 200. Okay. Oh, Tina, continue doing. So he's not ready. And what he's saying is, Tatina is continue. And this happens. They get caught up. They're talking to the LS team leader. They're trying to figure out what the rhythm is behind, and they get caught. And so he just has her continue until he's ready. So another 10, 20 compressions. Stops it as soon as he's ready to go, and then back on the chest. And so it's not so inflexible that, oh, sorry, you missed it. That's not going to work. In this case, um, he was. Kind of it. So, 19, 20, 180. Showing here, and this actually happened a number of times, where they're going to go into a pause, and he's not moving 17, fast 18, enough. 19, 20, 200. So he's 17, charged. 18, 19, 20, has a finger on the pulse. Stop CPR. I have no pulse. And he's not making the decision fast enough, so watch Tina. I might have a lead off. And she just starts. Crisis converted, right? So the pause didn't go on. Now, last thing is, well, what do we do with it when ALS arrives first? And they're just going down there that's about 33% of the time. And the answer is, you fill positions one and two. You fill positions in the order. Uh, numerical order. So Jim's in, uh, or Bill's in number one, Jim is in number two uh, position. Bill's on compressions, and Jim's just going to go right into uh, putting an OPO way in, getting on the breather mask on the patient, hooking up the, the monitor defibrillator so that he's ready to go at the two minute mark. And if the fire crew arrives, at any point, they just integrate in, and you'll see that here momentarily. 60. One of the pieces of feedback from people is that when you're paying attention to CPR, that two minute run is a pretty long run for the person doing compressions. Um, they, they, they are working hard. And um, I, I saw that as uh, sort of validating the idea that we likely weren't doing compressions like we needed to be doing compressions before this. 140. And so as you can see, Jim Scott the airway squared away, it's a clean airway, so he doesn't have to deal with it. Um, past getting the OP in and the non reader he's got a finger on the pulse. He's going to get the unit charged up. 180. So 200, he's charging, and you need to know how long it takes your result to charge. So, you know, what, what's the end point where you're not going to make it? There's no pulse, we're in deep in. And now the switch, and Jim takes over. And then you can run pit crew with two people. 
it gets a lot harder when you have to start filling it, but you can do it. And you see now, so Tina comes back into the number one slot, Bill moves down to the paramedic slot, and Tina's telling Jim at the 20 mark, I'm going to take over for you. And there's very little interruption. So Jesse, you can kill this and we'll go back to the slide set and wrap up here. Questions, uh, further questions about what you saw there? I, I do have some questions. Okay. Going back to times on how long to run a code. Two things. Because of the importance of interrupted or not interrupting compressions, what are your thoughts on transporting somebody who requires compressions? Uh, I don't think much of it. And here's why. When you go to move the patient, it will be very hard to avoid a 10 second or greater pause. Correct. And you have to view those greater than 10 seconds as you've killed the patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's how you have, bluntly, how you have to do it. The second thing is, are we still feeding out to the stations? I'm about to say something I may regret. You may pause it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we'll just give more witnesses. <laughs> if I have to be coded, I do not want to be coded in ER. I want to be coded by that machine. That's where I want to be coded. And so I, I say that, lots of respect for the ER, right? But they haven't adopted engineered resuscitation yet. And so what happens is, and, and boy, Central County, it just came back and this feedback in droves is, there went the compression fraction. As a matter of fact, what they started doing was saying, you get them onto your monitor right away. And people are like, no, we'll just stay on, our, on yours. No, you're not, because I'll have to answer for that. It's going to impact my compression fraction. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and to be fair, we never went after people about that. It took care of itself. If, if you're fill in the blank, you're medic, whoever, or you're uh, on an engine company or a squad in some station, and you get this email that that other people have gotten that says your performance was substandard, that just took care of itself. I mean, I always envision station captains going, this will never happen again. <laughs> and, and it took care of itself. So, you know, Austin, Travis County, Jeremy, if they, they get a ROSC on a patient, they slow things down, they eventually get loaded, they're in transport, and then guess what happens? They code again. They, they code again. What do they do? They pull over, take the patient out of the ambulance, and code at the side of the road. And, and the reason? Because you can't run an effective resuscitation in the back of the ambulance either. It's not safe to move, it's not safe to do. So that there, there you get a mix of my opinion and others, but um, you know, one of my questions for Dr. Myers when I saw him down at the Oklahoma Resuscitation Academy was, 40 minutes is a long time. I mean, I, I envision coming in to support epinephrine units, right? <laughs> and he kind of squirmed and he said, yeah, well, um, I don't know where that's going to go, but the idea that you need to keep giving epinephrine over the entire 40 minutes likely isn't going to stand for long. So I think the weather is continually changing in that. But my encouragement to you as, as you launch into this is, if you've got good end title numbers, keep looking to find the key and stay on scene. That was my next, my other, the second part was, uh, what, what part of, I guess how much do you let the end title drive that time? If you're getting a good end title, which is proving viability, do you keep working in, I mean, you got to have a limit it somewhere. Yeah, let's back up a little bit. I don't know that it's proving viability, it's suggesting viability. Okay. And maybe it seems like I'm doing, you know, a dance up here. <laughs> Trust me, you don't want me to dance. Um, it's time to start talking to medical direction and, and, and get a clinician involved with it. Um, you know, what, what have we not tried? What are things that we can try? Uh, so, like, if, if it's uh, still presenting as a shock of a rhythm, you know, that's where you get into uh, double sequential uh, defibrillation. So you've got two different layers on, pushing the button at the same time, uh, some things like that that 
uh, we've previously looked at and said, what? Then the answer is, well, no, that's pretty standard in some places. So um, would you not ever call the code with an end title of 18? And the answer is, no, you may well call that, but give it the time and, and have a clinician involved before you call it. It just seems there's so many times that, you know, by the time we make that transport decision and we start, you know, we stop compressions to put them on a board and then the time that takes you to get out to the truck and you're, you're doing something that looks kind of like compressions, but you're not. Right. And then you have half-assed compressions in the back of the truck. And then you get to the ER and they said, well, how long have they been down? Well, at this point, 40 or 50 minutes, call it. Yeah, so my blunt opinion is run it as long as, as you need to on the scene until you, you've got clinician involvement saying, yeah, okay, we're going to have to declare this when we lost. And that's how you should view it, is I lost. Don't go through all that other show, so call it on scene. And I, I do you routinely do that here? Well, I had the situation with Dr. Rosenberry the other day when I brought in a patient from Haven at Coded and we were on our way. And I talked to the nurse and told him what I was bringing in, and I had to call him back and talk to him. And he said, well, how long have they been down? Ice fix is an asystole and all three leads. And then he said, call it. And we were like on our way. We weren't even to the hospital yet. So we had to shut lights down and everything. And thank goodness I said something to the family prior to leaving the scene that more likely we weren't going to get him back, you know, with the rhythm he was in. But he called it right there. So I'm thinking that if we would have ran it on scene for as long as that, he probably would have. Yeah, I think it's something you want to talk with them uh, about. Uh, obviously, that's a physician directed thing, but you know, that transporting code loose, that's dangerous for you. As a matter of fact, I think it's Austin Travis County. They're transporting, when they transport a blue, it's normal traffic. Why? Well, because that's when we can do our best work and it's the safest. And so when you think about time critical things, this really doesn't fit into time critical because you are likely running a better resuscitation using this process than anyone else is going to run. And so, you know, the paradigm is really shifting. So this may be a crazy question, but in your video, your VLS triangle, do they not rotate then? Because they, they, they can, but uh, what we really like to see is that the number three person just stays in that slot. And so where, where you have extra people, um, and like in Wichita, so on a blue, you're going to have a squad and an engine uh, show. So you have five firefighters there. Three in the triangle, one's the VLS team leader, generally the captain. And then there's one that, that's roving. And so when number one is done, that person fits in, they go around. When number two is done, they fit in. So it just lengthens out the rest time. So yeah, and like I say, the, the one code I was referencing earlier, which was poolside at uh, one of the nursing facilities, there was a line of five people. And uh, when one would get done, the next one would step in the person who was done would walk around the pool and get back in line. And so it worked, worked pretty well. Cedric so County experience, uh, they doubled their ROS rate and the CPC ones and twos significantly shot up. I mean, it makes a difference. And uh, my good friend, Paul Masasi, uh, did me a favor. Uh, he's the clinical manager for EMS. He took the percentages and made it into real people. And uh, actually, this is an old stat now. We're probably uh, closer to 300 people today who have been discharged from the hospital, CPC one or two, who would have been left dead in the old process. So that's since 2012. And when I see that number rather than a statistic, that tells me that they're doing good work. They're making a difference in the community. And I'll end with this, and that is you can set out your plan and how you're going to do it. And Terry, I, I don't know what you have in mind there. My recommendation is pick a process if it's, if it's the one they're using or whatever, but get people together in the system, make sure it works for you guys, and go with it. The thing you have to remember is not every call is a perfect setup for it. 
And so at the end of the day, you know what the target is, get as close to the target as you can. And if you do that, you're going to make a dramatic difference in the lives of the people that you serve. Questions? No question. You gotta have a question. I'm gonna question this part. Right? I'm pissing people off. The line's getting out. <laughs> do you guys ever train, or do you not ever have the problem where you don't have fire available? Because, like here, I mean, they've only got seven stations, so they have a big fire. They don't respond to any of that stuff. So one of these days, it's gonna happen. And there's gonna be a code. Well, and it's gonna over measure. Right. Yeah. So what's your answer to that? My answer to that is, I would make sure that you know how to run a pit crew with two people, number one. I mean, you have to know how to do that, right? But secondly is, I don't know, maybe I could even do a monkey, an approachable monkey. I could train and do professions. So uh, now, I am not equating police officers to monkeys. <laughs> <laughs> I do pay respect there, but you you take law enforcement, uh, you know, out, out out in Arlington, I I'd be making friends with the, the city guys and uh, you know people who are doing uh, maintenance or whatever. If it's in a school, pull the teachers in, put somebody on that chest, give them a quick CPR lesson, have them go to work. There's this great story out of Minnesota about an hour out of the Twin Cities. Uh, guy codes, it's a small town of about 100 people. Uh, he codes, and the local fire department shows up in an engine, first responder, and they start compressions. Well, the town shows up, because, right, small town, sirens, here we are. And uh, they just got everybody involved. So they had this line of about 25 people that would do compressions for two minutes and go to the back of the line. And they coded for over two hours and uh, ended up life life flight crew out of Twin Cities showed up. They had some tools in a toolbox that aren't normally carried uh, and had direct contact with an intensivist and actually uh, got a save on the patient who walked out CPC1. And so my answer is think about the setting that you're in and know, hey, what what might I have to do initially because I don't have the support crew that I need? And B, who do I tap to get down on the knees and start doing compressions? That's always been my biggest concern. Yeah. Well, that, I, I mean, I think, I mean, fire is going to be awesome at this. We, I don't doubt that at all. In Rice County, we never had fire response because they were all volunteers. And the PD guys were good, just like John said. Some of our people would show up as extras when they heard the call come in. I mean, you can do it, but like it showed a video. I think mean, you had to start with two people. You still got to you still got to have compressions foremost in your mind, and then just work through it as you get more people on scene. And then, and the thing you didn't say about King County, one of the reasons they're successful there is they have a huge community CPR program. Yeah, their goal is to teach everybody in this entire metro area. Seattle CPR from the time you're in school all the way through so that's a big component as well. well I think that's a kind of problem. It is and, and I would tell you the other thing is that we're in all probably probability going to go back we're going to go to how EMD was originally supposed to be designed and that's dispatching the Al Alpha Bravo Charlie Delta because when you hear an Omega call you know that they're in cardiac arrest this echo. or echo. When you hear an echo call, you know immediately that that person's in cardiac arrest without all the, I mean, it's driving me nuts, guys, to hear the seven unconscious patients we have a day. And you never know until you're on scene or when you get there, whether they're really, I mean, you see it all the time on your phones is that it comes in and they dispatch you this unconscious call and you know they're breathing. They might have had a sink of one. So, so Shelly and I talked for over two hours the other day about that, and she all but said, she said, "You design the system however you want. We'll train to the level you want. And we'll make that happen." And it's a matter on their cards of just either pulling the slip out or hitting the button on the computer, and it'll tell them that it's a delta call or an echo call. I mean, so that'll help in itself, I think. The other thing that John mentioned is that 
that's 110, you can get a free app. Enter metronome on your phone or in your apps. They're all free. There's about eight different places that you can get one. You turn one of these on right away. Uh, we put metronomes up north on our monitors and they got broke the first six months because we're just rough on them. So almost everybody put a metronome on their phone and when they walked in, they hit the phone and there it is. And it's amazing, as John said, it's amazing to watch people do it with this because it's almost inbred. Yeah. I have a problem with it on my phone and one, I don't usually use my phone on a call because I don't want to get my phone yucky and gross. Uh, <laughs> First you assess the picture. <laughs> so I don't really want to use my phone. And two, I don't think it's that great for family or bystanders to see you pulling out your phone and punching around with apps while you're their loved ones lay in their bed. I think it's different when it's attached to the monitor or part of the monitor and it's another piece of equipment that you turn on. And it's standardized that way if something does go wrong with it. Like if it's on Monica's phone, I may not know how to work her metronome and then I'm down for however long trying to figure out how to restart that one, how to, what do you, I mean, have you seen, have you seen some different uses of a metronome other than? You know, uh, we have, we have uh, down in Sedgwick County, which uh, we have fire crews who, who would use phones, um, but we make sure there's a metronome on, on everything. And there is replacement costs. I mean, they, they get dinged around, so you got to pay attention to it. The big thing uh, that we worry about was it would break and no one would say anything, but they quickly realized the metronome is key to uh, a correct rate. And so about the first time one was broken, uh, they were actually hollering at me and it's like, yeah, I'm not your central supply. <laughs> I know that person, so I'll talk to them. Yeah, so but I find you your answer, and that's my encouragement, is get, get fire and EMS together in the same room with some crews and figure out what you're going to do. And then put that on paper uh, so that you, you, in your training, you roll that out and it's, it's the same for everybody. And, and that's the beauty of it in, in any system that's done it is I can be working, uh, filling in for somebody on my day off, I can do it with a completely different set of crews. EMS down there for quite a while has had a 30% turnover rate. And what does that tell you? That tells you a lot of medics showing up who don't know anybody. They don't even know the partner they're working with. Okay? You don't need to. Introductions take place, the call is run the same way. They're indoctrinated with it when they go through their academy on the way in. Um, so go find that space. Find what works for you with, with the metronomes. What rate are you going to compress at? What's your process? What are your positions? Where are you going to put equipment? Equipment goes in the same place on every call. That was not new to me. I was trained that way in 1980 and that's how we did it. But for a lot of folks when we rolled this out, it's like, you got to be kidding me. You're telling me where to put the jump bag? Yep, I'm telling you where to put the jump bag. And it doesn't belong at the feet, it belongs up at the head. And, and so do that level of planning first and then implement and tweak as you go. But don't don't tweak on your own. Tweak within the system of hey, let's look at this, let's make a change system wide. Questions? Any more? Thank you. Thank you. You heard it from the best. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you owe me money. <laughs> No, but I need to teach you how to keep you in your car. Yeah, no kidding. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the Yeah, it's yeah.